We're spending 22 minutes today with David Hyde Pierce. So great to have you here. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. A star of the star of a life at the playwright's uh, horizon. And the word about it is so great that it's already been extended, right? We, were, we extended even before we uh, started performances, which is nice. That's got to um, feel great. Yeah. And it is. It's a, it's a very interesting play. A wonderful writer, Adam Bach. It's a funny play. It's a kind of deep play, although you kind of don't realize it as you're watching it. It gets under your skin. And audiences, we've had, we had very mixed audiences, some very young people, some older people, and everybody seems to be kind of caught by it and really um, loving it. Um, the basic premise, you play Nate Martin. He's That's a right. guy and he's going sort of recounting his disastrous romances. He's, he's had a really tough time with love in his life and uh, he's one of these guys uh, one of the beautiful things that Adam has done here is he's kind of written just a guy it's not in a way someone special it's just a guy and you get a glimpse of his life and he's had a hard time and he spends a lot of his life trying to figure the world out because he feels like everybody else seems to kind of know what the world is like, what it means, and how are they supposed to behave, and he just always seems to be missing the boat, and he's had a lot of failed romances, and uh, um, early in, in, when he was in his 30s, uh, he had a run-in with someone, he was having a tough time running with someone who believed very deeply in astrology, and he connected with her, and it opened up this whole world to him for better and for worse, mm -hmm. and that's a big part of sort of where we find him as the as the play starts. Now tell me if this is right. I read there were like 16 pages of script, like a half hour of you talking. The, the, That's a lot. The very beginning of the play is a half hour of me talking. So if you're smart, you will not show up till a half hour in. <laughs> but unfortunately, they don't let in latecomers. So you have to sit there and listen to me in order to get the rest of the play and the rest of the cast who are really good. I heard that's the best part, though, because I, I heard that the audience sometimes, is it true that they, they, they talk back to you? Oh, yes. Yes, it's great. Well, it really is. I mean, it's a very small theater, first of all. It's like 128 seats right. uh, at Playwrights Horizons, um, which is, by the way, when I first came to New York in the 80s, uh, my first gigs were at Playwrights Horizons in its oh, wow. original form, which was a much smaller space, I, working on new plays by Chris Durang and Richard Greenberg and Mark O'Donnell. So th there's a lot of meaning in this for me to be back on 42nd Street, a very different 42nd Street than when I moved here because you had to sort of push the hookers and drug addicts aside to get into the theater, and now they're all in the seats watching, so that's great. <laughs> but. Um, but yeah, so uh, I can't even remember what, what you asked me. Uh, I just got on hookers and I drug asked you about how hard it must have been to memorize oh, that, that yeah. amount of dialogue. Yeah, right. uh, so I worked with this great British actor, uh, Mark Rylance. Uh, he's amazing. He just won the, um, the Oscar and uh, uh, won multiple Tony Awards. And he always says, because it's a frequent question with anyone who's an actor, but especially if you have like I do in this, uh, an extended monologue, people say, wow, how do you memorize all those lines? And Mark always says, the trick is not memorizing them, because that's what all actors can do that. The trick is forgetting them. The trick is making it seem like they're occurring to you for the first time every night, which I think is really true. And, uh, and it's the fun and also the, it, in a weird way, speaking directly to the audience makes that easier, mm -hmm. because it's different people every night, and you never know how people are going to react. And, for example, I said, you know, there's a theme of astrology mm -hmm. in the show. Well, people have very different feelings about astrology, and some people are really into it, and you'll mention a planet, and they'll go, uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> or, you know, you can see people are just like, oh, well, whatever, and, uh, and everything in between. Uh -huh. and, um, and then what's great, too, is older audiences tend to say things that you might not necessarily uh, say out loud, in general, but they kind of gave up on their filters years ago because they've lived long enough and they... And, I've earned the right. That's to, right. Yeah. What's, what's he doing now? <laughs> Things like that. And it's just great because, it, it, you know, it's all part of the experience. Do you think part of that is because people feel like they know you from, te from television? You've been in their living room, as people like to say. I think that that is really true. And I mm -hmm. think it's something I've been able to use and... Um, sometimes trade off on in my career since Frasier because 
you do become a very known quantity, especially on a comedy, on a sitcom, on something that ran for so long, you become a friend. You become someone who's been in people's houses. And so in a play like this, that's really helpful because people are like, oh, a friend of theirs is coming out. And you've, so you've already got kind of an open door to then take them on a journey with you. And right. they, they kind of already care about you thanks to the character you played uh, elsewhere. I want to mention another um, stage event, the, the Plaza. You're being oh, yeah. honored. The uh, 33rd Annual Drama League Musical Celebration of Broadway. Mm -hmm. And you're the honoree. That's right. That's awesome. It, so what it happens? It shows how far we've fallen. <laughs> no, the, uh, the producer <laughs> is quoted as saying it was very easy to get people to come to this because you are the honoree. Well, I, that's, that's nice. I mean, I, look, I've been in this business a long time. Uh, I, like I said, I came here in 81. I graduated from college and I started working and I spent the first at least 12 or 13 years here in New York doing theater. Went away to LA to do television and then came back. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I love it and I love the people of the theater. And sometimes, I mean, for example, my first job in 1982 was a play by Chris Durang. And just two years ago, I got to be in a new Chris Durang play, Vanya and Sonia and Masha and Spike, mm -hmm. on Broadway. Um, that's a long span to be working with the same people and to be reacquainted. Right. So it's, a, it's not just that it's me uh, being honored, it's that this is such a close-knit community mm -hmm. that we all um, respect and like and owe each other so much that mm -hmm. I think whenever one of us gets this opportunity um, we all show up. Now how does it work? Do you sit back like the folks at the Kennedy Center and just listen to the, the accolades pour in or do you have to give a speech? It's not, it's not like they roast you or anything. I don't know. You don't know? I have no idea. Surprise. I'm going to find out when I get there um, and uh, but I'm I, but it raises money for a good cause. It actually raises money for the Drama League's program for training directors. Mm -hmm. Um, and I started directing recently. I've been directing the last few years, and many people have said to me that it really would have helped to have some training. So I'm glad to support this program that <laughs> trains young directors. Speaking of good causes, mm -hmm. you've been uh, one of the more eloquent voices in the fight against Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. That work continues. It's personal for you, right? Yeah. So I uh, started many years ago uh, when I was in L.A., um, probably 93 or 94, I think, I got involved with the Alzheimer's Association there. My grandfather, my mom's dad, had Alzheimer's. And uh, uh, so I got to see not only how it affected him, but the toll it took on my grandmother as she was taking care of him. And then later on, my own dad had uh, dementia and uh, possibly Alzheimer's, and I got to see, my family got to see the toll it took on my mom taking care of him. So we've seen that up close and personal. And now I've been working um, nationally with the Alzheimer's Association here in New York with the Alzheimer's Association and an organization called Caring Kind, which is also sort of a local uh, Alzheimer's uh, group. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a cause that, like you said, it goes on. The fight goes on. We haven't found a treatment. We haven't found a cure. We will. We're very hopeful, and research keeps having little breakthroughs. Um, but, you know, one of the great sadnesses for me of the current political campaign is that whatever gets talked about, that's not one of the things. And it has now risen to the sixth leading cause of death in this country. Um, the financial cost because of, you know, all the attendant uh, issues that go along with dementia and Alzheimer's and the personal cost and all that. And to see it... Uh, something which is such a terrible threat and such a, a terrible burden to so many Americans and will be to so many Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, to see it ignored is hard. So uh, any chance I get to speak out about it, I do. Yeah. Interesting, I, I rewatched the pilot of Frasier last uh -huh. night. It really holds up. The, I know. The, the writing's just, it's just yeah. evergreen. It's fantastic. And it was interesting, um, I had forgotten that the pilot dealt with um, the dad coming to live with Frazier because yeah. he doesn't want to be um, left alone anymore. Yeah. But um, did, you, did you think when you were doing the show, when you, were, when you first signed on, that it would become such a legendary sitcom and that it would be such a, such a smash? Uh, no, I had no idea. Um, and, uh, uh, but I, the point you raise about the writing and also the point about that situation of the pilot, I think that's one of the reasons that it has longevity. The, the writing is so good. And it wasn't, it wasn't topical. It wasn't about what was happening in current events at the time. 
But I know that one of the creators of the show was dealing with the issue of uh, an aging parent and how do you take care of an aging parent. And he said, you know, this is something that has meaning for a lot of people. So the fact that, and that was the situation uh, in the pilot of Frasier, it was mm -hmm. dad who uh, was an ex-cop who was, you know, disabled because he got wounded in a, during a robbery and Frazier, who is at just at the point of his life where he wants to be independent and how these two worlds collide, um, it's a sitcom. It was funny, but it had its roots in a very identifiable reality, and I mm -hmm. think that's why it continues to be so watchable. Did they cast you um, before the part was even written based partly on your res resemblance, that's, they thought, to Kelsey Grammer? Is that how it went down? That's right. Um, mm -hmm. they, uh, uh, they were putting the show together, and uh, the casting director, one of the casting directors, uh, who had seen me on a, a, the other TV show I'd done before that, which was a political satire, a Norman Lear political satire called The Powers That Be, ran a very short time mm -hmm. on NBC. Um, uh, and uh, she just said to, to the creator, she said, you know, if you're ever looking for a, a brother for Frasier, this guy looks like him. And so they looked at the tape, and some of them had seen me on Broadway uh, in shows, and they decided to create the character. And when I signed on, all I knew, I went in and I had a meeting with them, mm -hmm. and we just talked, and they said, all we know is that um, because Frazier is a Freudian, Niles will be a Jungian, and <laughs> since Frazier went to Harvard, Niles went to Yale. My God, it's been so long. I think that was how it worked out. <laughs> um, and so I said, okay, well, I'll and they offered it to me, and that was it. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't think any of us knew how much that dynamic, that um, fraternal rivalry and camaraderie would become a part of the show. But uh, again, with great writers, you know, they, they're like dogs to the scent or truffle hounds or something. They see something that works and they just write to it. Eleven nominations for you, um, <clears throat> four wins, some TV trivia. You got more nominations than... Hot Lips, Houlihan, Archie Bunker, or Wheezy Jefferson. Not combined, but right. individually. Right, and of course it's the Wheezy Jefferson win that really <laughs> is the one that I know. No, but you know, that's, uh, those are fantastic statistics. <laughs> especially, especially, I got more nominations than Carol O'Connor playing Archie Bunker. That just shows you how little statistics mean, because <laughs> that is one of the great, great and most important performances in all of television. But, and also, I think Edie Falco, somebody beat me fine. I had more nominations yeah. than anybody until mm. she came along. She had to come along. Yeah. Uh, I, one, of the, one of the great things about the show, of course, was the Niles and Daphne storyline. There's actually something on BuzzFeed 23 reasons why Niles and Daphne are the cutest TV couple ever. I don't even know what BuzzFeed is, but I <laughs> love them. That's fantastic. I hope looks, the kids is, read it. looks is number one right now. Yeah. Uh, well, that's great. That's how, great. How, how did that work? Uh, when you first started working with Jane Leaves, what, was it instant, instant chemistry? And, and you, you dragged out that sexual tension over how many seasons? Seven, Seven seasons? seasons. Wow. Seven seasons. I was so sore. Um, it was... Uh, um, I'll tell you exactly, first of all, in terms of the chemistry with Jane, there was chemistry in, th in that whole cast, and it was like a laboratory, there was so sure. much chemistry. We just <laughs> loved each other, which is good casting, by the way. Uh, Jeff Greenberg, the casting director, um, you know, and, and the creators of the show, just having an instinct for talent, but also how people fit together. And Jane is really the one, I give her the credit, because when we were doing photo shoots before we'd ever, we'd done the pilot, um, and she kind of had the idea that Niles and Daphne could sort of be an item, so she just, we should cuddle up in the photo shoots, you know, just like lean on each other. And I don't know whether that's where the writers got the idea or not, uh, subliminally, but uh, it became a, a really fun thing to play. And like you said, it did drag on for a long time, and part of the reason we finally had to um, bring them together was it just stopped being possible mm -hmm. that these two people could not know what was going on so and it was fun doing that and then it was hard figuring out i think for the writers and the actors all right now what's the life after mm -hmm. that and i think the answer was ultimately that the focus of the show would go elsewhere that that you know them happy together is just not as interesting as right. need and un unrequited love yeah uh, did did they ever approach you uh, say let's let's do a show just about niles no no we uh we didn't talk about that i I don't think I would have done that. A friend said something really interesting about that, which is that a lot of times you'll do a spin-off mm -hmm. of a sort of a secondary character, and then that character, I mean, well, uh, Frazier is Frasier a great was, example, right, but yeah. he was not Ted Danson in, mm -hmm. in Cheers. 
But th I had gotten the opportunity to do everything on that show. That character went through everything. And so what was left? Where, what was there to explore? And for me as an actor also, it was, I think, better for me to mm -hmm. go at, and come back to the theater. Do they ever talk about a reunion show? I know you guys got together during that uh, James Burrow tribute. Uh, we right? did that, and, and we also had a... a what was it, 10th year, I guess? Or was it 20th? No, please. It had to be 10th. Uh, sort of reunion where we did a, you know, magazine spread or something like that. We have our own reunions. We get together whenever I'm on the West Coast. If I occasionally get to Chicago, I'll see John Mahoney. Um, or when Kels is in town doing a show, or if the girls come in to do, you know, see shows or do anything, we always get together. We're, we're very close and remain that way. We, um, we had Henry Winkler in here some time ago, uh -huh. and one, one of the... Uh, the takeaways from the interview he said it, he said it was really tough to get work after happy days ended because people said oh we love you but you're the Fonz yeah you didn't have that problem though did you or were you offered a lot of scripts that were just Niles type characters that you said oh, I don't want to do it anymore the thi well first of all Niles <clears throat> uh, was certainly unique but he wasn't the Fonz you know the font Niles didn't become a cultural phenomenon like like Henry's character did so uh, he really had a lot to, to get past which he finally did yeah. and for me um, yeah because what would happen is like in, in the interims in the breaks between the show uh, like on vacation I'd be offered movies but a lot of times they were the same character and almost never were they as well written mm -hmm. as the TV script so I would only do things that were different or or uh, the writing was good, and uh, and then I've been able to sort of worm my way away and uh, uh, do a, a wider variety of things. And win a Tony on Broadway. That helped. But, you know, going to the theater helped, because the theater is very open-minded. They see people in different roles all the time. You have to be strategic about how you do it. If I had come out and done, say, the Joe Namath story, I don't know how well the audiences would have responded, or even how well Joe Namath would have responded. But, uh, you know, so honestly, the first thing I did when I came back from television was I did Spam a lot, which was this right. big, crazy musical, so it was funny, and people were used to seeing mm -hmm. me be funny. But in it, I got to play a bunch of different characters. And so already I was able to just shake it loose a little bit and do, it was almost a kind of sketch comedy, very different from what we did on Frasier. And uh, so that's, uh, that's one of the great gifts of theater. Speaking of Broadway. Yes. Hello, Dolly. Hello. Coming oh. up in, in, in April. Yeah. You've worked with Bette Midler before, right? I did. She and I did a movie called Isn't She Great um, four, 400 years ago. <laughs> uh, and we spent a lot of time up in Montreal together. It was m me and her and Nathan Lane and John Cleese, uh, Amanda Peet. We had such a great time. And, the Jacqueline uh, Suzanne yes, story. Yes, she played was Jackie it? Suzanne, yes. wrote Valley of the Dolls. Nathan was her husband manager. And I was her editor on Valley of the Dolls. And... Uh, um, it was, a, it was a very different relationship than the relationship of the character Horace and Dolly in, uh, in Dolly. But uh, I really love her and I so uh, admire her. And uh, we've had a few little rehearsals, sort of workshop rehearsals already. And uh, she's, uh, she's incredible. I was going to ask you about that. So when do you get into the, you know, really the, the, the throes of, of uh, rehearsing Mid-January is going to be the actual, mm -hmm. you know, legit start of full-on rehearsals. Mm -hmm. But we're doing, uh, the producer very generously has allowed us to do um, uh, sort of a lab over the course of a few months now. So they're working on some choreography and uh, Bette and I got together with Jerry Zachs, the director, and uh, did some scene work and s sang through some stuff. I got to work on some scenes with Warren Carlyle, the choreographer, and Andy Einhorn, the music director. It's, uh, it's an amazing group of people. And uh, um, I'm just, you know, I, everyone's excited. Everyone's excited about the show. They're excited about Bet. They're excited that, oh my God, this thing is going to be so much fun. Mm -hmm. We know what it is. We haven't seen it in a long time. Yeah. It's iconic. Maybe there'll be something, a new spin, but not really. It's just a great show, mm -hmm. hopefully done the right way. Ticket sales have been unbelievable. The first day of, of ticket sales, yeah. we broke it. Well, you know those Frasier fans. <laughs> That's what's bringing them in. That's yeah. what's filling the seats. Yeah. Absolutely. We're running a four-second ad for the show. It's like, hello, Dolly, Bette Midler. I know. Yes. <laughs> what more do you need to know? Yes. No, it's great. And David like, Pierce. Yes. Well, it doesn't say that, but that's okay. It's, it's um, implied. Some projects that I was surprised that you did. Mm -hmm. Wet Hot American Summer. Yeah. Not just the movie. 
But the and series. And the TV show, yes. And I'm just about to shoot uh, the next installment of the series. Oh, really? We're, yes, we're already working on that. They oh, have a very funny idea. There's more. Yeah. Great. They figured out, because, you know, the, when they did the TV series, part of the deal was all of these no-name people that they had in the original movie are now huge, famous actors. Right, Bradley like Amy Cooper Amy and Amy Poehler. Amy Poehler. Yep, yep. And so <laughs> just the audacity of saying, yes, we're going to work out all of these schedules. And they wrote the movie around who could be where, when, and, and I mean, the TV show. And they did a really good job. So they're doing it again, and they've come up with a very funny bit because I can't be out there because I'm, I'm doing a life right now mm -hmm. while they're shooting. So they've come up with a very, I think, good bit for my character to be part of the movie. Uh, even though I'm not physically there to shoot, I can't wait. I, Me I was, either. I was, I was sad when the first season ended. That was. <laughs> I have a, a sweatshirt, uh, you know, a wet, it, it's a camp firewood sweatshirt, and it says "Wet Hot American Summer" that we got when we did the TV show. And the reaction you get from people when they see that sweatshirt, it's so great. I mean, people have a very personal. <laughs> slightly insane relationship with that material. They just love it. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, television, would you ever consider doing a TV show on a regular basis again? I mean, if, you know, people, people say, oh, this is the golden age of, of, of television. So much, so much great stuff out yeah. there. Yeah, well, there's a, yeah. I mean, for me, it's about the material and the people I get to work with. And uh, I think you're right about the sort of golden age of television. There's so much good stuff, high quality writing and uh, uh, being done. Um, I did a stint on The Good Wife uh, right. in its uh, last season, which I loved. And, uh, um, it, you know, ask me at the end of next, after I've done a year mm -hmm. on Broadway of uh, Hello, Dolly, uh, I may really be ready to just do television. <laughs> or I may think, no, 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 this is it. I gotta, I gotta stay in the theater. So I don't know. But it, it, it's the project as opposed to the medium for me. Well, looking forward to seeing you in A Life. Hello, Dolly. More Wet Hot American <laughs> Summer. What more can we ask for? David Hyde Pierce, so great to have you Likewise. here. Thanks, Bridget. Thank Thanks you so much.